I want you to picture the world as it was 150 million years ago, late in the Jurassic period. You are almost certainly picturing a lush world of dinosaurs and green vegetation. Animals like these theropods, ornithopods, and stegosaurs roamed the land, along with the first feathered dinosaurs, the ancestors of modern birds like Archaeopteryx here. These guys, however, probably didn't actually fly, at least not very far. It is possible that these early avians evolved feathers to help them regulate their body temperature and only used their wings for short flights as they glided among the trees. The skies instead belong to pterosaurs. Pterosaurs are now extinct, but they were flying reptiles, not dinosaurs and definitely not birds. They were nonetheless the first vertebrates to evolve powered flight on our planet, and some of the largest, if not the largest flying animals of all time. Unlike birds, their bodies were covered in small hair-like fibers, and their wings consisted of skin, muscle, and other tissues, not feathers. Other animals that lived on land in the Jurassic included various species of lizards and amphibians, crocodiles, and small early mammals. The climate was generally warm, humid, and wet, so many of these animals lived in jungles. But the forests were nothing like the jungles that exist today. There were no flowering plants. They hadn't evolved yet. Seed and cone producing plants called gymnosperms would have dominated the landscape. Pines, cycads, ginkgos. Life below the sea was also familiar, but different. Yes, there were fish and sharks and many invertebrates like clams, snails, squid, and octopi. But most reefs were built not by coral, but by an order of clams called rudists. And some of the most common invertebrates of the time were ammonites, squid-like animals that produced thick, coiled shells made of calcium carbonate. There are no similar animals alive today. And of course, there were no whales or dolphins. In their place, the ocean contained many large marine reptiles, mosasaurs, pliosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and plesiosaurs. Suffice it to say that the world was very different in the Jurassic. But why? Why do strata that differ in age have fossils of different species. What do the fossils tell us about the evolution of life and the three-dimensional relationships of strata? How can we use fossils for stratigraphy? The differences in fossils can be explained by the principle of fossil succession, more commonly referred to as the principle of faunal succession as it is usually applied to fossils of animals or fauna. This principle tells us that the oldest fossils occur below the youngest fossils in a sequence of strata. This idea makes a lot of sense given the principles of superposition and included fragments. Superposition tells us that older strata occur below younger strata. And the principle of included fragments indicates that the fossils must be older than the strata themselves. Fossil species that occur in old rocks do not occur in young rocks and vice versa. 
Earth history has seen major changes in the dominant animals on our planet. Whereas dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and other reptiles prevailed in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, the Cenozoic has been ruled by mammals and birds. These changes are a natural consequence of evolution. In the context of this discussion, we can think about all of the changes in life on Earth in terms of two processes, speciation and extinction. Speciation is the process through which new species originate on our planet. Organisms evolve new traits and diverge from their ancestors over time, becoming increasingly different and unique. Speciation is the process that caused us, humans of the species Homo sapiens, to diverge from other apes and hominids. Over time, all species become extinct. For one reason or another, all of the individuals of a species may die, and no living members will remain to continue their legacy. There are many paths to extinction. Some species meet their demise during catastrophic events like asteroid impacts. These events tend to cause many species to disappear all at once. Other species go extinct more quietly. The dodo bird was first observed by Dutch sailors in 1598. In the following years, it was hunted and its habitat was destroyed by sailors until it was last seen in 1662. That said, its extinction was not immediately noticed, with some believing it to be a mythical creature. Since then, we have come to realize and appreciate that humans are responsible for its extinction, even if it did go unnoticed at first. It is important to recognize that speciation and extinction are natural processes on our planet. Sometimes new species originate or die off in mass. Other times these things are very rare, but species are appearing and disappearing all the time. How long do most species exist on Earth before they go extinct? It depends on the organism. Some species go extinct not long after their origination, while others have survived on Earth for hundreds of millions of years. The fossil record suggests that most species survive for only 10 to 20 million years between appearing and disappearing. The Earth is roughly 4.5 billion years old, and animals evolved more than 550 million years ago. So we can safely conclude that many, many species have originated and gone extinct over geologic time. For their part, hominids, our most recent ancestors, were generally short-lived. Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, most of these species went extinct in less than one million years, or so we think. In any case, many organisms leave behind fossils. According to the principle of included fragments, if a rock contains a fossil, then the rock must be younger than the organism that produced it. But given that most animals have short lifespans in comparison to geologic time, we can simply say that a fossilized organism lived at the time that its rock was deposited. At this point, it's safe to say that fossils of a species can only be found in strata deposited between the times of its speciation and extinction. It did not exist prior to these events or after them the fossils will only occur in a specific range of strata. 
We refer to this as the stratigraphic range of a species. It is the continuous interval of rock that may contain fossils of a species. The fossils do not occur in strata that are located above or below this range, either because the species did not exist or it was never fossilized. Here, you can see a geologic section. This strat column illustrates the stratigraphic ranges of conodonts in this part of the Silurian system. Each vertical line shows you the range of strata where you can find a specific species. The base of the line is the oldest fossil of its type. The top is the youngest. Stratigraphic ranges serve as the basis for the field of biostratigraphy, which is the science that uses fossils to analyze the three-dimensional relationships of strata. Scientists working on biostratigraphy study fossil assemblages. A fossil assemblage consists of all of the different species found in a single stratum of rock. Like lithostratigraphy, biostratigraphy involves the study of geologic cross sections called strat columns. Scientists look for abrupt changes in fossil assemblages going up section from the oldest to the youngest rocks, or down section from the youngest to the oldest rocks. The most important fossils in assemblages are called index fossils. An index fossil will tell you the age of the rock. This illustration shows you a number of index fossils and their periods of time. As you see on the bottom, if you find strata containing fossils of the trilobite Paradoxites, then you can be confident that the strata are Cambrian in age. Conversely, if you find fossils of the clam Pectin, you can be sure that those fossils are much younger. They provide a fingerprint for the quaternary. When certain strata can be recognized based on the presence of one or more index fossils, we refer to this interval as a biostratigraphic zone or biozone. There are many ways to distinguish one biozone from another. A biozone may be defined based on the presence of one species, two species, or more. They can be defined by the absence of one or more species. And there are acme biozones, which are recognized for having an abundance of fossils of one species. Once you figure out your biozones and index fossils, the last step in biostratigraphy is to look for them in different strat columns. Think of a strat column like a fingerprint. The lines are index fossils and biozones. The goal of biostratigraphic correlation is to identify the similarities among strat columns and demonstrate that they have the same lines. The overarching goal of biostratigraphy is to identify time equivalent rocks or rocks and strata that formed at the same time, albeit at different sites. This is achieved through stratigraphic correlation of multiple sections. Correlation involves determining the equivalence of rocks at different sites based on their biozones. Two intervals can be correlated if they contain the same index fossils. The intervals may differ to a degree in terms of the thicknesses and lithologies of the strata and the presence and absence of various structures. But the fossils, they are the key. As before, lines of correlation should never cross. The fossil succession should be virtually identical in two sections for them to be correlated. It takes time to learn to identify specific types of index fossils and biozones. 
These are skills that come with time. But the hardest thing to appreciate about biostratigraphy may be the scope of it. Scientists have been doing biostratigraphy for hundreds of years. Rocks from all around the world representing hundreds of millions of years of Earth history have been correlated with each other on the basis of their fossil assemblages, index fossils, and biozones. Indeed, biostratigraphy was probably the driving force behind the creation of the geologic time scale, a system of chronological dating that relates rocks to time. Rocks of different ages and periods can be recognized from their index fossils. For this reason, we should be happy that the Jurassic was so different than the world today. That means all you need is a fossil of an ammonite or some sort of dinosaur to know that you are looking at rocks from the Jurassic period.